We are continuing today in, in our series, The Emphasis of Ephesus, and we are looking at the book of Ephesians in the New Testament, a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church of Ephesus, and we're in the fifth week, but the fourth chapter. The fourth chapter of Ephesians, if you're reading along with us um, in this study, uh, the fourth chapter is mostly about unity, but it gets very deep, very fast. And so trying to figure out what I was going to preach on today from chapter four was a little tricky. Obviously unity, but how we were going to approach that. When you think about the church around the world, unity is something that is so unbelievably important. Um, and it's honestly, there's a very beautiful picture around the world when, when we travel in different places in the world, you can sense and see the unity of the body of Christ. And it's a beautiful thing. But the other side of the spectrum, there's also um, a not so beautiful side of uh, that in church. It's, there's a lot of division in church. And if we're being really honest, there's a lot of uh, temptation for pettiness and something that should have been a small disagreement to grow into massive divisions. And if we're being honest, that is there and we are susceptible um, to that as a church always. And so that's why the Apostle Paul prioritizes unity so much. Speaking of pettiness, I was actually on a website this last week called pastors.com. Very simple, pastors.com. And there was this funny list it's sad and funny, but there's this funny list of real situations that have actually happened in church that caused church splits. Division in the church where one church became multiple church over a disagreement in the church, and these are actual examples of the level of pettiness that can creep in if we allow it. Here's a few of these things on the list. The first one, an argument over the appropriate length of the worship pastor's beard a real situation that caused a church split. Let's go to the next one. A fight over which picture of Jesus to put in the foyer. It's real. Some of you guys are like, this is why I didn't go to church. <laughs> Welcome. Not all churches are like that. We're trying to build one that's not, but this exists and we're trying to squash it. Amen? Okay, so here we go. Next one. An argument over whether the church should allow deviled eggs <laughs> at church functions. Are you serious? Somewhere in America... There was some disagreement in a church business meeting about deviled eggs. Next, a disagreement over using the term pot luck instead of pot blessing. Because we can't talk about luck in church. The next one, an argument in church. Somebody got that real late. An argument in church over who has access to the copy machine. What? Okay, let's, let's go to the next one. Um, one ministry group hid the vacuum cleaner from another ministry group. These are real. These are not made up. Hit the vacuum cleaner. Another one, an argument over whether to have gluten-free communion bread or not. <laughs> Lastly, on this list, there were so many more, but I, I just got to stop somewhere. A, a dispute over whether the church should allow people to wear black t-shirts, since black is the color of the devil. <laughs> I always thought it was red, but if it was black, I, I would be a mess because I wear a black t-shirt almost every Sunday. But these are very real things, and we're laughing but somewhere in our country when this was happening, people were crying and they didn't wake up to how stupid the pettiness was. And the Apostle Paul knows that and that's why he talks so much about keeping the unity, fighting for unity in the church because human nature is not to be unified, it's to be divided. We see it in our world, we see it in the church and we have to be a church that's committed to unity. Unity is a huge deal to God, so much of the New Testament, but also out of the mouth of Jesus. Jesus is praying in John 17, and it's this one prayer. It's a send-off prayer, and, and this is what he talks about, unity. He says, I pray that all these people continue to have unity in the way you, Father, are in me, and I am in you. I pray that they may be united with us. So here's the big kicker. So, so why, right? So the world will believe that you sent me. Jesus is saying this. Unity is the number one reason people will look at us and believe what we believe to be true is actually true. Because if we can be unified in a world that is only divided, then we will show the world what it really means to be with Jesus. So our text today in Ephesians 4 I'm going to read verses one through three. It says this, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, talking about himself, 
the Apostle Paul, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. This is how he starts the chapter. When I was researching for this um, chapter and this message today, um, there was a group of theologians and pastors about a decade ago that were asked if you had one sermon left to preach, and that was it, what sermon would you preach? The vast majority of the pastors referred to Ephesians 4. They said, I would preach on unity from Ephesians 4 because being a unified church is the only way to win and change a divided world. And I, I think it's unbelievably important for us when we look at scriptures like this and passages like this, not to just go through a chapter, but to dig deep and ask God what he's really trying to show us. Unity does not mean uniformity, though. It's a commitment to shared beliefs and identity in Christ. It's not uniformity. It's harmony. It's not sameness. It's oneness. We don't all need to look the same. That would be horrible. We don't all need to have the same backgrounds. We don't all need to be the same nationality, race, ethnicity. We don't all need to speak the same language. We are the beautiful, diverse body of Christ, but there is a unifying factor where God is saying, in the middle of all the diversity that he created, I want you to be one. I want you to be unified. So what we're gonna do today, we're gonna ask two questions and answer these questions from Ephesians 2. Now, I'm gonna be honest with you. I didn't realize this until I was preaching in, in the earlier service, but not only do I have two main points, I have subpoints. And check this out. In my first point, my subpoints have subpoints. Yeah, it's one of those sermons, and I, I'll make it up next week. But here, here's what I want us to, to do today take notes, stay with me. We're going to dig deep and move, but I would highly recommend this being a personal Bible study for you as well. So the first question we're going to ask is this When it comes to unity, what is it that unifies us? What unifies us? What do we unify around? What's the foundation of our unity? I've heard a lot of people over the years talk about um, the Christian denominations around the world and how many of them there are and use that as an example of why they don't want to be a Christian because Christians can't even get on the same page. I get that. I understand that to an extent, but I don't see it that way. I don't see the many denominations around the world as an example of we can't get our act together. I see it as an example of the beautiful body of Christ with all the different parts making up the same body of Christ. Now, don't get me wrong. There are some fringe denominations that are weird, that are not biblical, that I would actually say, according to scripture, they are not a part of the body of Christ. So then how do we know? How do we know, looking around the world, what we unify around? What makes a true church? What makes a true believer? Now, when we look at this, there are seven unifying elements that the Apostle Paul says we rally around. Before I read through those, though, I want to read a quote from Augustine. I love this when it comes to all the different denominations and different methods of Christianity. He said, in essentials, the essential doctrines, unity. In non-essential liberty. In all things, charity. We have a posture of charity. That doesn't mean a charity isn't, yeah, do whatever you want to do, but it's kindness in all things. We have an open hand with the non-essentials and a closed hand with the essentials, and this is how we know we are in the body of Christ. But Paul explicitly gives us the seven unifying elements, and he says this is what makes up the closed hand of how we know if it's not this, it's not Christianity. If it's not this, it's not a body, a part of the body of Christ. And he tells, them, tells us these in Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. He says this, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and God, and one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Paul gives us seven one statements. So if you're taking notes, let's go through these. Seven unifying elements. Number one, the apostle Paul says we are one body. Now, all the other six flow out of the first one. So what does this mean as a unifying element? 
Colossians 3.15, the apostle Paul also wrote, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts since as members of one body, you were called to peace. We are members individually in the micro sense, but also in the macro sense. So in the macro sense, every church, if it agrees on these seven things, is one body with different parts, right? It's the same way on a micro sense with us as individuals. We are a part of the body of Christ. You are unique with who you are as a person, your spiritual gift, your natural talents and giftings, your background, your story, your testimony. That makes you unique and valuable to the body of Christ. We are different parts of the same body. But how do we know as individuals? How do you know as an individual that you are in fact in Christ? And when I say the body of Christ, where you know for a fact, yep, that's me. I'm a part of the body of Christ. How can you know that? Well, I, I wanna give you, this is the subpoints have subpoints part. Here we go. I wanna give you five C's that will help you identify, am I in the body of Christ? The first C is convicted. We can point to a time where there was a moment where we had true sorrow over our sin and we had the conviction of sin to understand I need a savior. Be, getting saved and, and moving into a life with Christ is not, I feel really good today and I want to go to heaven, so I'm gonna raise my hand and say a prayer. That's not salvation. Salvation is, I have to know what I need salvation from. My sin. Jesus is Lord and savior. So we have to get to a place where I have mourned over my sin, therefore my next response is, I need a savior, which is the second C, convinced, convinced. So we are convinced of the work of Jesus. So we are convicted of sin. I see my need for a savior. Now I'm convinced of the work of Jesus and what he did on the cross. What he did on the cross is sufficient to save me from my sins because he's the perfect lamb of God, sent by God the Father, his one and only son, because he loves me. He died on the cross, resurrected, and because he did those things, I can call on him to be my Lord and Savior because I've been convicted of my sin to see my need, and now I am saved. But that's the first C. The second C, the third C is converted. I know that's like an intense Christian word, but looking at the true sense of the word, it means transformed. Now, it can't just be, I need Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I I'm, I'm, feel guilty of my sin. I'm calling on him to be Savior, but I'm gonna stay in my sin. I'm gonna just manage with the guilt. That's not salvation. You can't get saved and stay in what you needed to be saved from. It's not about being perfect, but you have to be transformed. And it's through God's grace. It's not your own power. We are changing direction because of our repentance. Then we are convinced of the work of Jesus. It's by my faith and his grace, but then I am converted. I've turned my back on my sin and I am being transformed by Jesus. And then the fourth C is conformed. Now I'm transformed. The old is gone. The new has come. Now, according to Romans, Romans says, be conformed to the likeness of his son, Jesus. In my life, Jesus is the only perfect person that's ever lived. It's not about being Jesus. It's about becoming more like him every day, not less like him the more I call myself a Christian right? So we're, we're working our way through these C's. We have conformed, and then the last C is communion. This isn't the taking of communion, although that's amazing and awesome and necessary. This communion is the literal definition. It is the union, the community, and the unity of the body of Christ. We are coming together as one. This means when you, when you hear people say, I'm a Christian, but I don't do church, that's a Christian that hasn't read the New Testament. That's a Christian that doesn't understand what the church is. It's not a box you check and a place you go. It's a body to be a part of, right? So these are the five C's. How I know, am I in the body of Christ? Have I walked those out through the work of what Jesus did on the cross? So the first one, the first unifying element is one body. The second unifying element is one spirit. The apostle Paul writes, it's by one body and one spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, for in one spirit, we are all baptized into one body. It's one spirit, talking about the Holy Spirit. 
It's belief in the Holy Spirit. It's not denying the power of the Holy Spirit. It's understanding that the Holy Spirit is the lifeblood of the church. It's the breath of the church. On the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter two, when the Holy Spirit fell in the upper room, they were empowered from on high. The Holy Spirit's power is what initiated and inaugurated the church of Jesus Christ. We are the body of Christ, but the breath of the body is the Holy Spirit. There is one spirit. And what's so amazing about one spirit is this. No matter where you go in the world, it is the same Holy Spirit working in churches in South America and Asia and the Middle East and Africa and Europe. It's the same gifts of the spirit empowering churches there as he is empowering churches here. It's the same fruit of the spirit being produced in the Middle East as it is here in the United States. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. All the gifts of the Spirit, healing and miracles and, and tongues and interpretation of tongues and prophecy. All of the gifts of the Spirit are alive and working in every church in the entire world because it is one Spirit. And that one Holy Spirit gives us the same Spirit to wherever we go, we see our brothers and sisters in Christ. We see our brothers and sisters in Christ in churches in our own city, other churches in our own city. It's the same Holy Spirit. There's an ancient prayer, and we, we pray this a lot in Alpha. There's an ancient prayer that just says, come Holy Spirit, and it goes all the way back to first documentation to the third century. I personally believe one of those powerful prayers you can pray on your own when you don't know what to pray I believe with a physical posture of receiving because what's true for the body is true for the soul. I'm opening up and I'm saying, come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit, one of the most ancient prayers in the church. Why? Because I want in my life what happened in the upper room. I want in my personal life what can happen around the world through the one spirit. So we have the one body of Christ and then we have the one Holy Spirit. You guys can see how these close handed um, non-negotiables are forming. Number three, we have one hope. This is a short one. It's very explicit and very simple, but very profound. Our one hope is not a random hope. It's not a wishful thinking hope. It's like what I talked about a few weeks ago with the anchor. We have an anchor for our soul. It's not a wishful thinking hope. Our hope has a name and his name is Jesus. Specifically, this hope is talking about what we call in the church world, the blessed hope. The blessed hope. What's the blessed hope? It's the return of Christ. It's the hope that no matter how dark this world gets, we have a king that reigns over it all, and he hasn't left us alone, and he has promised to return again. And every knee will bow, and we will come out of our graves because he resurrected, we resurrect, and we live forever, and we are waiting on the blessed hope, the return of Christ. Uh, Titus 2.13 says this, we are to be looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. My, my wife Mandy and I were talking about this a few weeks ago. I don't think churches preach on this enough. I don't think we have. And I promise that will change. We need to be looking up to heaven and awaiting the second coming of Jesus like the apostles and the early believers did in the New Testament. What this means for us is that one day all the tears that we are crying here and all the pain that we are experiencing here with cancer and with sickness and with death and with all the things that are happening, we have a promise from God. Those that are in Christ, one day our eyes will close in this world, open in the next, and there will be no more tears. There will be no more pain. We will be united with loved ones because we have a blessed hope. Revelation 21, four says exactly that. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. We have a hope. Number four, we have one Lord, one Lord. We have one Lord to lead our lives. I've never had a conversation with a Christian where they said, I know Jesus is Lord, but I actually have four Lords or three Lords. No, I've never heard a Christian say that, but I sure have seen Christians live as if that were true. What this is a reminder of is we only can have one Lord of our lives. The Lord can't be money. The Lord can't be ambition. The Lord can't be our kids' schedules. There is only one Lord who reigns over our lives, and it's Jesus. And very explicitly, another factor on this, the Apostle Paul, remember, is writing this in prison, 
but not a random prison, a Roman prison. Who's the leader of Rome at this time? Caesar. Caesar was minting coins, calling himself the son of God, and wanting the entire empire to worship him as God and even burn incense to him as God, and he wanted them to call him Lord. So think about the nerve, the backbone that the apostle Paul has to write a letter to the church of Ephesus while he's sitting in a Roman prison saying, there's only one Lord. So you better not be going and burning incense to the man who wants to be called Lord. And if we're being honest, there's a lot of men and women. They don't say it, but they want to be worshiped as Lord in our world. And Paul's saying, there's only one Lord that can bring hope. There's only one Lord that can bring real change. Philippians 2, or I'm sorry, Romans 10, 9. I love this and the power of the word Lord and the meaning of it. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is what? Lord. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. This is how much the word of God emphasizes that Jesus is Lord. It is a part of how we come into a life with Christ. We call him Lord. We say, you're the Lord of our lives. Philippians 2, 11 through 10, or 10 through 11. At, that, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. One day, no matter how much people have mocked him, no, no matter how much evil there was in the world, no matter how much evil has been spoken against Jesus, one day, every believer, non-believer, atheist, every person will be in the presence of Jesus, and the only two things we will be able to do in that first instant is to drop to our knees, and the second thing will be declaring, you are Lord. Every knee will bow. No matter how defiant and prideful people are, we will close our eyes in this life and open them in the next, and all that will be able to come out of our mouths is Lord, because we will be in the presence of the one true God. Number five, one faith. Are you guys still with me today? Both campuses, you guys still with me? One faith. What this means is not one of many faiths. There are not many roads to heaven. There is not one God with all these different religions worshiping him in unique ways. There is one God and one faith. One faith. One way to heaven through Jesus Christ. Our faith says that Jesus is the fulfillment of all Jewish prophecy. He is the Messiah. And through Jesus Christ alone, we have salvation. That's it. There is one faith. This summer, I did a series on the Sermon on the Mount, and I talked about how Jesus's arms are wide open to everyone. But the way to heaven, the gate is narrow. His arms are wide open. Anyone who calls on his name, but there's only one faith one way. And also with this one faith, it's a one faith that never changes. It's a timeless faith. It should be the same faith today as it was 2,000 years ago. That's why we fight to go back to the New Testament and look at what the New Testament church was doing for discipleship, what they believed about the Holy Spirit, not what the latest theologians are saying, but what does it say in the Bible? What is the timeless faith of the Word of God? And what I love about this is no matter what's happening in culture, no matter what the definitions of sexuality are, no matter what is happening in morality and how people are defining all of these different things, it never gives us a right to be jerks or mean, but there's one true factor. Culture does not define our faith. We have one faith that comes from the word of God and it is timeless. Can I get an amen for that? It's timeless. One faith. Jude wrote in his book, in the, in the New Testament, Jude 3 through 4 says, Dear friends, although I was very eager to write you about the salvation we share, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once and for all entrusted to God's holy people, once and for all. For certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. So Jude is saying, I was gonna write you about salvation. 
But what I'm seeing in the church now is we're allowing voices to come in to try to distort what the word of God says to give allowances for sinful lives. And again, we have to have grace for people, but we can't have grace for the distortion of the truth. That's what we can't have grace for. At some point, we have to draw a line and say, enough is enough. If the word of God is good enough for 2,000 years, and it will be for the next 2,000 years, if Christ doesn't return, it's good enough for us today. And I know that's a hard truth, but it's the truth. It's the truth, and we need it today because it will save your life. It will change your life the moment we realize there's one faith. Number six, one baptism. One baptism. Let me tell you quickly what this doesn't mean. When you first read this, you might be thinking, well, Dustin, I've heard you preach before that there's water baptism, and then there's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That says there's one baptism, so which one is it? In context, obviously in scripture, there, it explicitly tells us there's water baptism and there's baptism of the Holy Spirit. This, when Paul's writing this, he's saying one baptism. He's writing in context to the church of Ephesus because at that time, previously, he was going around on his missionary journeys. And one of the first conflicts in every single uh, location when he would stop was the question and dispute over which baptism should we do. The Jewish baptism of repentance or the Christian baptism, Gentile baptism, of water baptism, acknowledging what Jesus did on the cross. The old is gone, like what we did today, symbolically. The new has come. I'm a brand new creation. That was the dispute. So the apostle Paul's writing saying, there isn't a a, a baptism for Jews and a baptism for Gentiles. There is one baptism, and it's the baptism where we understand what Jesus did, that we go into the water as symbolically the old person dies, the brand new person comes out of the water, but baptism, the baptism metaphor doesn't stop there. The meaning of baptism is we come out of the water and not only do we have a new life in Christ, we have a new family in Christ. We are now in the body of Christ. That is the purpose of it. And Paul's saying there's one baptism. To, to illustrate this in, in scripture and to validate what I was saying, 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 14 says, For just as the body is one and yet has many parts, and all the parts, though many, form only one body, so is it with Christ. For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, spiritually transformed, united together, whether Jews or Greeks, Gentiles, slaves or free, and we were all made to receive one spirit since the same Holy Spirit fills each life. There's one baptism because there's one spirit. And then number seven, lastly, there's one God and father, one God and father. Genesis one, one, one of the most famous verses in the Bible, the very beginning of it just says in the beginning, God doesn't say God's. It just says God. And what we find from the very first, this is why I'm showing you this, what we find from the very first verse in the Bible is there is one God, but we also see throughout the entire Bible in that God, we also have a father, the nature of a father. I talked about this in week two. I think my, my favorite metaphor in the New Testament of what salvation looks like is the adoption into the family of God. Remember that? We are not all children of God. We are only children of God when we have called on the name of Jesus to be savior. So we are in the family of God when we are in Christ and he's our father. When you you think about the Lord's prayer, you know the famous Lord's prayer, Jesus is teaching his disciples how to pray. And when he's teaching them, he says, this is how you should pray. And he, in this prayer, when he's talking about the father, he doesn't say my father in heaven. How does he start it? He says, isn't that unique? We we shouldn't just read over that. Jesus could have looked at his disciples and said, he's my father. He's your God. But he says, this is how you should pray. Not only is he your God, but he's our father. Jesus is saying this in the same way. Jesus is speaking this. He's saying in the same way, God, the father is my father. In the same way, he's your father. He's your father. And until we understand his nature as father, 
we won't fully understand the loving nature of God. And depending on who our earthly father was or is, that may taint the image of our heavenly father. This is why it's so unbelievably important to go to the scripture and to see his true nature. And if you want to know the nature of the father, look at the nature of the son. The nature of Jesus is the nature of the father because we have one God, one father. Now, these seven things, this is what we rally around. This is what we die for. This is where we put a stake in the ground. This is it. These seven factors, if these aren't at play, we don't have Christianity. All the other things, open-handed, and there's liberty. If that, that's one of, the, one of the things I love about the church world. You could drive through the city of Albuquerque today, and there's going to be hundreds of churches that fit into this seven unifying factors. And what you're going to see is different expressions of worship, some quiet, some loud. You're going to see people in some churches decked out in suits in their Sunday best. That's great. You're going to see other churches where it's more casual. You're going to see big. You're going to see small. You're going to see different methods. That is all. That is not a marker of how bad the church is because we're so divided. It's a marker of how beautiful the church is because we're so diverse. It's one of the reasons here you will not hear me talk negatively of other churches. You will not hear me talk negatively of other pastors. I won't do it. Because we are all different parts of the same body of Christ if we rally around the same unifying elements. Are you guys with me today? It's very important for us to understand that. Very important. So I want to go back to Ephesians 4 before we ask our second question. And then the whole second question is our closing. Ephesians 4, 3 says this. Paul says, be eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. So our second question is, how? How do we practically maintain that unity we just talked about? What do I need to do as an individual? How can the petty divisiveness be stopped? What do we need to do? Well, there's five things that I pulled from Ephesians 4 that I want to quickly give you as practical ways and steps to maintain the unity. You can write these down. The first way, according to verse 15, we need to speak the truth, yes, but in love. That's actually one of our core values at our church. We speak the truth in love. It's so unbelievably important to speak the truth, but we need to do it in love. We have to, because that's how Jesus did it. It's truth in love. Now, I'm going to give you an example of this. I told you a few weeks ago that one of the weeks in this series, I'm going to be talking about what our postures should be as Christians in light of the election coming up. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the nature of politics and those things. Well, I said I wasn't going to tell you when, but I changed my mind. I'm going to tell you when. It's next week. It is. So I'm going to preach the truth in love. I'm not preaching my politics. No, I will not do that. I am not preaching my agenda. I'm not going to tell you who to vote for. I'm not going to defame um, politicians but I am going to tell you what the Bible says, and we are going to talk about how elections don't solve the world's problems, but they are a piece to what we are called to as Christians to be a part of, to leverage everything God has called us to leverage to bring heaven to earth. It doesn't solve every problem, but it is a part of the solution. So I'm going to talk about that next week. So I'm telling you that, side note, if you are looking to bring your neighbor for the very first time, you can, because I'm preaching the truth in love, but if you don't want politics to be their first Sunday, maybe invite them the next Sunday. <laughs> but don't you appreciate that I would at least tell you? So the first practical thing we need to do is, is speak the truth. Don't shy away from the truth, but in love. Practice it. Get accountability for that. Number two, let go and forgive. According to verses 26 and 32, there's this theme of let go and forgive. This is hard for me, and it's hard for you. But we don't want this to be in Scripture sometimes. Because when someone hurts us, I don't want to read, let go, forgive. I want, I want to read, it's okay for me to hold on to this and not forgive. But how we keep the unity, maintain the unity, is we learn the art of let go. This, let God handle this, and I'm going to forgive. Forgive discipline yourself. Forgiveness isn't because I feel like forgiving. It's a spiritual discipline. I discipline myself to forgive. 
Every time I talk about forgiveness, I will always say what I'm about to say for clarity purpose. Forgiveness does not necessarily mean reconciling abusive or unhealthy relationships. Forgiveness is far more about you and God than it is you and the person. You need to get healthy with God and you need to let God be God and you stop trying to play God with what the punishment should be. Let go and forgive. Number three, work for the betterment of others. Work for the betterment of others. Now, this comes from verse 28, and if you have your Bibles and you're reading verse 28, what you're gonna see is this is very explicitly condemning people who don't work that are physically able to do so. The Bible takes work very seriously. From Adam and Eve in the garden, I'm gonna talk a little bit about this next week. One of the first things God told mankind to do is work in the garden. God wants us to work with our hands. He wants us to have work ethic. Because what he wants us to do, what the scripture says is work, earn a living for the betterment of others. It's a call to generosity. It's not a call to work hard to gain for me. It's to work hard to gain for the sake of others. This is the anthem of the New Testament, generosity. It's not about hoarding. It's about giving to other people. And it is a huge call on working hard and giving more. Number four, speak life. Speak life, verse 29. Um, it just talks about the way we speak. Man, this has caused so much division in churches, in the world, but especially in churches. We have to watch how we speak. We can't slander. We can't gossip. Gossip is evil. It is a, a sin that, that, that people tend to look over, but it is no different than any other what we call major sins. Also with being vulgar with our language. Watch what you say. One of the things I was talking with a pastor friend a while back, and he said, why do you think cussing is wrong? You know, the, the, you know he's, obviously he does, but why do you think it is if the Bible doesn't explicitly talk about the cuss words we have today? I said, my practical thing is this. If the secular world deems these cuss words as bad enough to make movies R-rated, then shouldn't our standard be a little bit higher than the world? Why would my standard be the same as the world's? This movie's bad because of the way people are talking. Well, I'm not gonna say those things. Your pastor doesn't say those things, by the way. I'm not gonna say those things, and you shouldn't either. We have to up our standard on how we speak. Are you different than the world, or do you talk the same way as the world? All right? That got a little quiet. Maybe I should hit on that a little bit more. And number five, reject gossip and negativity. This comes from verse 25, practical. Reject gossip and negativity. It's not just a call to not gossip or not be negative. You need to reject the negativity that people bring to you. Don't be an incubator of negativity. Don't be a negativity and gossip magnet. Don't do it. It's not a compliment. It's not a compliment. When, some, when people constantly come to you with their negativity, that should set off alarms and red, raise red flags like crazy. Why do people feel so comfortable coming to me and gossiping to me because something about you says it's a safe place to do that. Now, you might be thinking, safe place? That's great. I am, you know, that's what it is, Dustin. I'm just a safe place. You're not called to be a safe place in Scripture. You're called to be a sane place. You're called to be a place of sanity. When someone comes to you with negativity, you're called to listen and then in a sane way, tell them what they should have done in the first place with that negativity. Oh, you're coming and talking to me about that. Hey, I hear you. But the Bible actually says, go to them first, and if it can't be resolved, then go to the leaders, and it can't be resolved, and then so on and so on. I, I don't wanna hear this anymore. I don't wanna be the magnet for negativity. You can always come and talk to me, but don't give me information I can't help solve for you. Don't do that to me, that's gossip. Don't come and tell me about somebody else because you don't want me to like them because you don't. Don't do it. And verse 25 ex explicitly says, rejecting all falsehood. Reject it. These five practical things are so important for the life of the church, who we are as individuals. This can apply to families, workplaces, but the call of Ephesians 4 is for the church. We have to be different. We have to fight for unity. The Holy Spirit initiates it. It's our job to maintain it. Fight for unity. This sermon I forgot to say this at the beginning, is really a part one 
to a part two next week. So this week and next week are part one, part two. So this week is all about let's stay unified. And then next week, I'm, I'm going to address like what I mentioned earlier in light of the election. Now, what I'm gonna do is read to you from Ephesians 5. I, I don't know if we, I, it might say four still. I, I gave them the wrong reference, but it is from Ephesians 5. I'm gonna read the scriptures that I'm gonna be preaching from next week as a segue to next Sunday. So I want you to all be back next week. Um, it, it's gonna be one of those messages that I think can challenge all of us, including myself. And Ephesians 5, 15 says this, 15 and 16. Therefore, see that you walk carefully, living life with honor, purpose, and courage, shunning, this is strong, we'll talk about it next week, shunning those who tolerate and enable evil, not as the unwise, but as wise, sensible, intelligent, discerning people, making the very most of your time on earth, recognizing, this is important, and taking advantage of each opportunity and using it with wisdom and diligence. Why? Because the days are filled with evil. That's what we're gonna be looking at next week. Do a study of Ephesians 5. Come prepared, come with your hearts open, your spirit open next week, and I think we're gonna have an amazing time. Here's what I wanna do today. If you would bow your heads and close your eyes here and at our North Campus, I wanna end every week in this series giving you um, the explicit, uh, direct opportunity to make things right with God through Jesus and what he did on the cross. When Jesus died on the cross for us, he died as our Lord and Savior. Why? Because of the five C's that I've mentioned. I've told you the gospel today. I've told you the, what, the consequences of our sin and the only way to heaven is through Jesus. So this is our time to do what Romans 10, 9 says. If we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. So if you're in here today and you would like to be included in this final prayer here or at our North Campus, I'm gonna ask you to be bold in a moment. I'm gonna count to three and I'm gonna ask you to lift your hand. I'm not gonna have you stand or come forward. We're just gonna end with prayer. I'm gonna pray with you and for you and we're just gonna pray this prayer together. And I believe according to Romans 10 that you can leave a completely different person than you came in today. So if that's you and you wanna take advantage of this moment and you say, that's me, I wanna make things right with God today. I wanna be in Christ, a part of the body of Christ, and I wanna step over that line. On the count of three, if that's you, I would love for you to raise your hand so I can know who I'm praying with today. One, two, I would love for you to be bold in this moment. Three, right, raise your hand wherever you are. Thank you, thank you guys. Keep them raised just for a moment. I wanna see who I'm praying for. Thank you, thank you. Thank you guys, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Awesome, I see you guys up there too, thank you. You can put them right back down, wow. Amazing. I wanna pray and I want you to make this prayer your own today. It's not my prayer that saves you, it's the declaration from your own heart. But God made it so simple, but yet it's so profound. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for today. And God, right now in this moment, if we were one of the ones that raised our hands, Jesus, we invite you into our lives. We believe that you have transformation power in our lives because of what you did on the cross and who you are. You died for me. It was my sin that put you there. And today, Jesus, we know you're alive and we are calling on you to be our Lord and Savior. We believe in our hearts that you were raised from the dead. And today, Jesus, we want to walk in a new life with you as brand new creations. The old is gone and the new has come because we are declaring, Jesus, you are the Lord of our lives. We thank you today. God, I pray for every person in this room. Inspire us with unity, God. I pray that you would spur us on, that your spirit would empower us and enable us, that we would leave differently than we came in. I pray blessing upon our families and blessing upon our city. In Jesus' name we pray. Everyone said amen. amen.